Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming and attending this introduction to manufactured housing um, brought to you today. Um, we are excited that um, wherever you are, near, far, or wherever you are, we're glad that you were able to take some time out of your schedule to be able to have um, this uh, discussion with us and go through this series. This is a series of four um, webinars, um, all centered around manufactured housing. Um, and so we've got quite a bit of information to go through today, but let's want, we wanted to, to start off by going through some um, housekeeping elements um, and rules. We just wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page. So today being um, for November 1st, um, today uh, we have um, a few things we wanna make sure that you know. First is that uh, you're muted um, and your cameras are off. That's all attendees um, will, will remain in that manner, in that um, sector, it'll be, your camera's gonna be off and you're also, you're gonna be muted. But however, you look down at the bottom of your um, screen, there is a chat bubble there. Um, use that chat feature um, for any troubleshooting issues that you are running across. Um, and address that message to the host because our host, Erica Bellotta, is keeping track of those and um, there to try to assist um, where possible. Additionally, so we will have the ability to have some questions and answers, and of course, we encourage that. So next to the bubble where you see the chat feature is three little dots. If you click on those three dots, you'll see a menu come up and one of the, the very first menu item on there is Q&A. So if you click on the Q&A, you would be able to, um, you know, post your, your um, question or write in your, your question. Um, and you're gonna do that to all panelists so that we see that that's there and then we'll be able to um, address those accordingly. Um, maybe you've already noticed, but this webinar is being recorded. So the video and the transcription plus the Q and A's will be available after this webinar. So to get us going on this, I wanted to introduce myself formally. My name is Deidre Coles. Um, I am a senior consultant with Capital Access. Um, we are one of the HUD provider, technical assistance providers. I am joined today, um, my, my pleasure and my privilege to continue to work with him. It is Stan Fetterman from SFF Consulting Group. He is also a subject matter expert and will be tag teaming with me today as we um, review the information on this introduction to manufactured housing. But before, we do, uh, but we get right out the, the gate on that. We want to kind of give you kind of what your appetite for what we're going to be covering today. So um, we're going to, we've got our whole introduction. We've got a, um, a real treat um, for opening remarks and I'll share who that is and um, what that's all about in just a moment. But we're going to be defining what exactly is manufactured housing, the benefits. We're going to be covering that of manufactured housing. We're also going to have a nice, robust amount about it, the information about ownership and governance. And there will be some things you want to make sure that you tune in for um, as we go through how manufactured housing addresses community needs. And then we're gonna also though address some of the challenges and possible solutions um, for uh, entertaining the use of manufactured housing units within our um, respective communities. And then we have uh, expert insight. We've got an interview that's going to be um, the, to occur that's gonna talk about some innovations that's happening right now with manufactured housing. So you definitely wanna tune in for that one. Then we'll round it out with some Q and A. So, as you come up with some questions, feel free to go ahead and put those in the Q&A. You may find that it may be addressed a little bit later, but as I uh, in indicated initially, that this is the first of a four-part um, webinar series on that. So um, at this point in time, I'd like to go ahead and move right into our introduction. We have um, the pleasure of having with us for the opening re remarks, 
the principal deputy assistant secretary of housing um, and planning and development with uh, Marianne McFadden. And so, um, Secretary McFadden, please give us some opening remarks. Thanks, Deidre. Hi, everyone. I'm Marion McFadden, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development. It is great to see so many people turning out to um, learn more about manufactured housing. Uh, we've got almost 400 people now, and I know there'll be others watching later. Um, it's so important that we are all here learning about manufactured housing because I know you've probably heard it before. Researchers estimate that there is a shortage of 3.8 million homes nationwide. So it's encouraging to me to know how many folks want to learn about what more we can be doing to support housing and specifically affordable housing across the country. Here at HUD, under Secretary Fudge's leadership, we are using every resource we can to boost housing supply, to preserve and rehabilitate our existing housing stock, and to deploy innovative solutions. Increasing the nation's housing supply is a priority for the Biden-Harris administration. And manufactured housing is one of the lar largest sources of unsubsidized affordable housing in the United States. In addition to preserving existing housing, manufactured housing is an innovative strategy for addressing the affordable housing shortage. Manufactured housing units can be produced quickly and cost effectively. And enhancements to the HUD code, which you're going to hear about, have resulted in greater quality, disaster resilience, and sustainability. Additionally, there are home ownership and resident managed governance options that provide stability and autonomy for residents and enable the manufactured homeowners to build equity. Soon after I started this position last year, Jason McJury and I visited manufactured housing communities in Maine. I was impressed by the quality of the homes, the use of CDBG to support their infrastructure, and especially by the way that the homeowners banded together to form a resident-owned community. You're gonna hear more about resident-owned communities later, but my biggest takeaway was that they are successful at containing the cost of living in manufactured housing communities without sacrificing qualities, qualities of um, the homes. Key components of the administration's housing supply Action plan and HUD strategic plan aim to make it easier to finance manufactured housing units and support the development and preservation of manufactured housing communities. So we're really pleased to partner with our grantees, stakeholder groups, and local communities to leverage manufactured housing as a strategy to boost and preserve the nation's affordable housing supply. I am so pleased that Congress gave us $225 million this year uh, for a new grant program for manufactured housing communities and residents. Look for the rollout of the competitive price program notice of funding opportunity later this year. Eligible applicants for the price program designated by Congress include tribes, states, localities, resident owned manufactured housing communities, cooperatives, nonprofits, and CDFIs. I'm also really proud to say that we recently published a new notice in the Office of Community Planning and Development around the use of annual community development block grant funds. You may know that program as CDBG. And that goes into detail about how we can support development of manufactured housing in communities, including using CDBG dollars for the purchase of manufactured housing units. We know that awareness of how to support manufactured housing residents is not what it should be. So we created this webinar series to introduce important manufactured housing concepts and discuss our updated policy guidance and layered financing strategies. We're also really excited um, about the opportunity to support tribal communities who seek to develop manufactured housing as a solution to their unique housing needs, because we know that manufactured housing stock is especially important in Indian country. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And Deitra, now I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. That was exciting. There's so much that's happening. Um, and we are super excited to be able to be part of this. Um, and the fact that you all also see the importance um, that's fantastic that you're here. So let's start um, right into the webinar series on defining exactly what is manufactured housing? What are we referring to? 
Well, we're talking about a factory built housing unit and now it's on a permanent chassis. So we're talking about a chassis is like a, a base frame basically for vehicles. So on your vehicle, on your car, your truck, it has that that frame that's there. That's what we're talking about. Also, um, manufactured housing units have that and then it's transported to a designated site then connected to the utilities. Um, in order for manufactured housing for the factory built units that we are we're going to be referring to, there's a couple of things we need to make sure. Number one, um, the fact of the matter is that these units are constructed to HUD's code, and that's the HUD's Manufactured Home Construction and Safety Standard. Um, we provided to you there on the slide where you can find that um, information. It's 24 CFR Part 3280. And you'll even see a little bit later, I'll be making some references to where specifically you can find some information. So if you don't have your pencil and paper yet, you might wanna grab that um, and then be ready for, for that information as well. Also, a factory built housing unit and the manufactured housing that we're, we are referring to has to have been built after June 15th, 1978. So not just, you know, in 1978, no. There's a specificity there, June 15th, 1976, excuse me, I said 78, it's 76. So we want to make sure that we are completely clear on that and what we're talking, talking about. Now, because there are various types of factory built housing. Um, so let's just kind of break it down. You see, we've got like five little panels that's there so that we can have a clear distinction. So in this webinar series, we are talking about manufactured housing. So it's built to that HUD code that we identified that's in part 3280, and that it is built after HUD's code adoption, which was June 15th, 1976. So that are, that's the two qualifiers that's there in reference to manufactured housing. Now, there are some other units that are pre-1976 um, that were built, and these were built under, you know, some, uh, a mix between state and voluntary standards regarding the safety of those units and the quality of those units. And they're, you know, roughly it by industry uh, termed as being mobile homes. Um, and there's various codes that regulate their construction. So in the the uh, frame, the panel number two, so just so for process of elimination, so we're not talking about any of those that is pre-1976 that fall underneath this. Going to the third panel, there are um, items such as modular housing. Now, those particular are also factory built housing and they're built to a state or a local code um, as stick, big home, st stick built homes. And we're gonna go over what that defines in a moment, but it has to be installed on a permanent foundation that's there. So it's gonna be your concrete foundation at the site that's there. Um, but it's not subject, those units are not subject to the HUD code and they may include um, all so we're not talking about modular housing. There's also panelized housing, and those are where the wall panels are built, and then once they get to the site, they're assembled all together. Um, and those are constructed to state and local building codes. For the purpose of this webinar, we're not referring to penalized housing. And then the last panel is site built housing, and that's the stick built. It's usually referred to as being stick built because it's built on site and it has to, of course, um, be uh, the state and local building codes have to be met or exceeded. And um, so it, it either can have some element um, of factory built, but 
the base, the whole, the whole uh, premise of site built housing, stick brick housing is that it is done on that particular site where that home is going to be located. So for the purpose of this um, webinar series, we're not going, we're not talking about site built housing. Once again, we are all talking about manufactured housing as was defined. So how exactly does it get, how, what's this process? How does it get constructed? Well, it's constructed in a factory or a facility that's off site someplace else. Um, and then once it is um, completed, um, the site, while this is being done, while the, the construction that's happening in the off-site facility is happening, simultaneously, the site where it's going to be placed is created and prepared so that when the home is fully constructed and delivered by a truck, then it's set onto the site and it is um, then prepared so that all the utilities and everything gets hooked into it. And then it can move toward substantial completion, which requires some inspections along the way. Now, after it is set up there at that home site, well, there's also some other cosmetic minor items to make it um, comfortable and for, and you know, it might, might even be be termed as possibly um, you, your landscape and your scaping so that you can, it looks attractive for, um, you know, to blend in with the community and or, you know, uh, any of those other items that um, the end user may like or the manufacturer is installing. So this is the method that occurs for manufactured housing, how it gets from the factory or the, the place where it is um, uh, created and constructed to from the fact some the from the facility onto the home site. And that's the process. And it's a repetitious um, process. And we're going to actually talk about that a little bit later, um, especially when we talk about the benefits of manufactured housing. So you say, well, Datra, how do we tell what a manufactured housing if it's built to the, the HUD code? Well, there has to be a certification label. And that label, and that is part of the requirement, part of the regulation that is there, that is um, identified in 3280.11, and that section is called certification label. Now, this certification is um, done by the, is completed by the manufacturer, and it has to be permanently affixed to the exterior of the manufactured housing unit. Even within the within the regulation, it gives exactly what it needs to look like, what it has to look like, um, and the components of it. So it has to be a two by four size. It has to be per, um, permanently attached to the um, to the home, um, that the housing unit. Even there is specifics with where it goes. So we're talking about this. You see this red label that's there. That is going to be um, approximately one, one foot up from the floor and one foot from the roadside, and it's going to be in the back, usually somewhere in the um, tail lighting area, um, and that's where that particular label is going to be permanently affixed. Now, it also is, it requires that it has a six digit number and that six digit number is going to be the manufacturer certification number. And so that is going to be there. So in, in case you were trying to identify and or know how do we know that this is actually one that's built to the HUD code, that is gonna be one of the things that you're going to look for on that manufactured housing unit. And it, it has to be there permanently in order to meet the requirements. Now that's on the exterior. On the interior though, there is a data plate that's required. And this data plate provides, it's like an eight and, eight and a half by 11 
Um, and this is a sheet of, of paper that is affixed. So you can normally find this, this description, this data plate, um, uh, when you open up the kitchen cabinet, and it could be um, affixed to the inside of the cabinet door or an electrical panel or even affixed to the um, one of the, the walls in the bedroom closet. Now, this information shows the wind zone, snow, lobe, snow load, and roof load of the home. And it provides um, all of the information that is needed in, um, in order to capture that information inclusive of a map that actually shows you where those different zones are. It contains the name and the address of the manufacturing plant, as well as the serial number, the model number of the manufactured unit, and also the date that the unit was manufactured. So those are two distinctive items that um, are required on manufactured housing units, one being on the exterior, one being on the interior, and it should have that information that's there. Feel free as well. Um, finding that information regarding the data plate is um, located specifically at 3280.305 under structural design requirements. So you wanna be, be a, be able to make sure that you make reference to that um, to so to clearly identify manufactured housing units that are built to the HUD code. So the question is, now that we know what we're talking about as far as what a manufactured housing unit is, what are the benefits? Why are we even here? Why are we even talking about this? Well, there have to be some benefits and we're gonna go over those right now. Um, because when you think about site built, site built houses on an average can take up to 7.2 months. And there's a lot of factors that, that can either um, lessen or <laughs> expand the amount of time it takes to build that site built house. Um, some of those factors um, we're gonna go, go over in just a moment, but the fact of the matter is that it takes it takes long a, a good length of time in order to build a site built home. However, with manufactured housing units, a factory um, built home can reduce that construction time by twenty to fifty percent. That's huge, especially when in all of our communities there is a huge need for affordable housing. And that production schedule, you want to make sure that that's a tight production schedule so that as many individuals and families can be properly, safely, um, and have a housing quality um, there within our, our respective communities. So looking at manufactured housing is something that we need to take a really good close look at because of the time factor. Now, we were talking about why does it take up to 7.2? Well, you know, we've got over 400 participants here and you all, everyone knows that we've got weather uh, situations, no matter whether you're in California and you're in the Carolinas or Florida or wherever, Dakotas, Utah, wherever you are, there are things that we cannot control. And some of that is weather, right? Or either damages because of um, asthma, um, things that may occur. Like you know, we 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 are all um, in. Depending on where you live, we've got hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, things of that sort. And when we're faced with those challenges, it only lengthens the amount of time it takes to build a site-built house. However, with a factory built house, you will reduce that because everything is contained within that, um, that factory or um, that facility. And so what can happen is that things can be happening simultaneously, whereas at the home site, there can be a, the preparation for the home site is, can be working at the same time as the construction of the home that's happening in that facility, in that factory. 
And having those things happen concurrently with one another lessens the time it takes to be putting that um, affordable that that manufactured housing unit into service um, as part of the affordable housing units that, that um, we are utilizing within our communities, our respective communities. So really, when it comes down to it, it's really more control. Um, because we're trying to have as much uh, inventory um, that is safe, you know, so safe, it meets code and its quality as possible to address the housing needs that we are facing within our respective communities. And it also allows for a better coordination when you have um, different trades and reference that they need to do. So you're not kind of held um, captive of waiting for subcontractors to finish one other job that might be clear across town. Um, this is a way to be able to um, have this housing uh, unit built faster and uh, faster and put in service faster than a site built home. So what, let's quantify that um, just a bit because the cost per square um, for a site built house um, can vary depending on where you live. However, in this, um, we wanted to show this particular graphic because it actually does a comparison of site built um, versus manufactured um, housing, either as a single unit or a double, or they call it single wide or double wide. But it gives like a, it provides a three year analysis of the average construction cost per square. So we see how the differential, the, the amounts have changed from 2020 um, to now, of course, 2020. Um, we all know where, where we were and we were all, um, you know, dealing with the challenges of um, the pandemic that is happening. But now that we're, you know, we're further down the line um, now, we see that with construction being has taken back off, you see construction happening. Um, we have the uh, data it, that shows that for in 2022, the average cost per square for a site built was $168.35 per square. Now look at the um, at the average amount for a manufactured housing unit. You see that $90 to $81 per square. And that is a cost saving, especially when you're trying to um, provide um, suitable, affordable housing units within your communities. So there is a cost effectiveness, definitely, um, with entertaining the use of manufactured um, housing units. And let's go over that just a little bit as to why it is cost effective. Uh, well, one, it promotes efficiencies and eliminates the need for all the different subcontractors as we identified a couple of slides Previously, sometimes it becomes difficult um, because of the fact or matter of the scheduling, trying to get um, the trades in, the subcontractors in to complete their portion of the work. And it becomes very, it becomes challenging, right? So it, within a factory, though, the construction is a repetitive task. Um, so maybe you all have watched any documentary or anything about how it's made and you see the inside of different factories and it's a you, you'll see it's a repetitive thing. No matter what they're making, it's a continual, it's the same widget, it's the same thing that, that continues to happen. And by doing that, they're able to be able to detect any type of defects in the in the. Uh, materials and you have a higher level of quality control that occurs in, within those um, factories and those facilities in the construction of that manufactured unit. Additionally, work schedules, they can be uh, managed more efficiently 
and with the differing type of weather delays that happen everywhere, no matter where you are, then you can kind of contain that. It actually, it is contained because you have, you're protected by, you know, the, the walls of the factory or the facility and that construction can continue to happen regardless if it's snowing outside or torrential rains or anything of that that factor may um, that may cause a delay. So utilizing um, this method does identify cost effectiveness uh, with the work schedules as well. And then also there is economies of scale, meaning that you can buy the materials um, needed for the uh, construction of this manufactured housing unit in bulk. And when you buy it in bulk, there's usually some the some savings that's there. Um, and then you can also uh, you also receive um, savings because you can have those materials directly acquired from suppliers um, rather than having to wait through our subcontractors. Now, mind you, we love our subcontractors, so this is not a poo-poo you know, party for on, on subcontractors. But what we're talking about is a way to, that manufactured housing can be cost effective. Um, and as we saw in the previous um, slide, we see that there is that cost effectiveness um, and the timing, not just the cost effectiveness, but also the timing um, is more efficient and uh, in the creation of these manufactured housing units. So time check, Deitra. We have about please. six minutes left of um, content time to present. Not a problem. Okay, and the other element um, in reference to manufactured housing is the energy efficiency of those units, um, because the energy efficiency standards that that we're occurring, hence the reason why it's part of the HUD code, is there also that there's um, eco-friendly materials that are used, and also energy star, so that it reduces the amount of the energy consumption that is occurring in the utility cost for the end user, and that's an important thing as well. I'm going to pass it over now to Stan Fritterman, and he is going to start us off with um, the ownership and governance that's associated with manufactured housing communities. Stan, take it away. Thank you, Deitra. That was great. Great information. And now I just need the slides advanced. Are you, are you driving, Deitra? All right. All right, so let's talk about ownership and governance and <clears throat> with manufactured housing, various models that people own these units. One is the land lease model. It's most common in manufactured housing communities. The homeowner owns the unit, but rents the land, so they don't own the land underneath. There's fee simple subdivisions, which are common outside of manufactured housing communities. Homeowner owns both the unit and the land underneath it. There's also just folks who have put one on lots as long as zoning permitted. Um, have put put manufactured housing units on their own land that they own. And then less common, and we're going to talk about in a second, is resident-owned communities, which is a manufactured housing community where the homeowner owns the unit, but the land and amenities are in common ownership by all the residents. So let's look at the land lease model. So in these the homeowner is considered a homeowner, uh, even though they rent the land. There's a highly likelihood of housing instability in these because the manufactured homeowner um, doesn't own the land. Homeowners return on their investment and their home depends on the community owner's decisions whether to continue the community operation and to continue to maintain it. So the owner of the community could make a decision they no longer want to be in that business and they could sell the property. So the own community owner owns and maintains the infrastructure. They also typically own all the shared facilities. They're responsible for maintenance on the infrastructure and the shared facilities. Um, they can increase the land lease rents as, as often as they would like. And sometimes that means those land lease amounts can go up to an unaffordable amount. In most states, they can sell the property 
legally evict the residents who own their homes, but tell them they no longer can keep their homes there. And again, in most states, this is going to cure with little notice and with limited relocation assistance. Now, um, according to Fannie Mae, who you could uh, looked at this using uh, American Community Survey data, only about a third of of the uh, manufactured housing units are shipped to manufactured housing communities, which means that in other cases they are going to single family lots or subdivisions. So two thirds of the manufactured housing units that are built in the U.S. don't go to communities. Okay, so resident owned community model. So, according to Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae's competitor, there aren't many of these. There's about a thousand out of the over 46,000 mobile home manufactured housing communities in the US. Only about a thousand are resident owned. In this case, the residents own their individual units, but they collectively own the community through a nonprofit, other kind of framework, and they govern themselves. So, what that means is that the um, residents control the ownership entity, they own the infrastructure, they own the amenities, they own the shared facilities, they're responsible for maintaining it all. And as owners, they vote on major decisions. They elect a board to oversee the day to day operations, kind of similar. Some of you, you know, familiar with condo style ownership. It's kind of similar to that in terms of who owns it, having everybody own and manage the common space. In this type of model, there is, you know, uh, gives the residents more uh, stability, more housing stability. The land's not going to be sold for another use, or it's unlikely it's going to be sold for another use. Rent payments for the lots are designed to cover operations and reserves, not to maximize profit. So it reduces the chances of rents being increased to a point where they're unaffordable. Obviously, that could happen, but still, it reduces it the chances. Now, the next model I want to quickly cover is the, um, the fee simple ownership subdivision model. These are often platted developments like every other subdivision, only they can be limited to manufactured housing. The homes are typically on an engineered permanent foundation. Uh, HOA manages the common areas and we don't have a slide for it, but the other way that folks acquire and, and live in manufactured housing is by having it on a lot that they own provided the zoning would permit it. Okay, so how does that manufactured housing address communities' needs? So it's an important part of the Biden-Harris administration's Housing Supply Action Plan and HUD Strategic Plan. We're going to talk about those in a later uh, webinar. Um, they're lower cost, you know, unsubsidized affordable housing. Um, so they're unsubsidized, so it makes them a cost-effective solution for housing shortages, potentially. Um, it can provide an alternative path to home ownership for lower income households, other than buying the, the you know, as we talked about the site built homes, which are more expensive, take longer. The shortage construction timelines can more increase the supply of housing a little bit faster. Um, and post, as we're going to see in a minute, post 1994 manufactured housing has greater wind and earthquake resilience. So they've done well in some of recent uh, natural disasters. Okay. So HUD supports and encourages, including manufactured housing, community residents and community planning processes and increasing the supply of manufactured housing options, promoting ownership, um, advancing sustainable ownership by encouraging manufactured home and site acquisition and uh, rehab manufactured homes and MACs to make them climate and more hazard resistant. So let's talk about some challenges and some solutions. And you know, one that you know, I really kind of want. Glad we have this in here is on outdated perceptions. One is that oh, manufactured housing communities aren't really neighborhoods. People are constantly in and out. Folks are no more transitory than other homeowners. From all the research we've had on those, um, estimates indicate that only one between one and seven percent of manufactured homes are ever moved. It's expensive to move them. It's also it can be. Uh, hard to move them, especially if they're on a permanent foundation. So these are, this is a different entity than we may have thought of in the past. Manufactured housing is, you know, typically uh, not moved. The quality issue, you know, you know, the first wave of these in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, pre-1976, they, they did have some quality, they had quality issues. But with the HUD code in 76 and the amendments in 1994 that had more wind and other resiliency uh, requirements and additional standards and additional changes. Um, 
the quality has gotten is is very high. And another myth or outdated perception is that they don't appreciate. In 2018, the American Community Survey did census did some looking at housing prices and how they've changed. And what they showed is that you know, that manufactured homes in on individually owned parcels do appreciate and they're new. So the data isn't great yet, but it also appears that in residents owned communities, they also gain value. Okay. Um, disaster resilience, you know, we've all heard perceptions and all have ideas that they don't survive a natural disaster, but with the HUD new code in 1994, additional features you can do such as berms, such as bringing something above base flood, um, these homes are surviving uh, natural disasters quite well. The pictures we have here are from a 19, uh, 2005 study commissioned by HUD that looked at damages um, from post-1994 homes and pre-1976 homes in Hurricane Charlie, which hit Southwest Florida in 2004. And what they showed was that the homes built post-94 did very well. And as you see here from the picture, it's got, I think it's got one broken window on the side and we look at the one um, the other picture of the pre-76 home that was destroyed same storm same part of the state um, we're also putting if you go back for a second data or not really but um, tornado shelters and we also put in resilient community buildings and manufactured housing communities that could have a, a generator in it so that you know at least where i live in the southeast our natural disasters tend to happen in the summer when it's brutally hot so we could actually have um, a community center that would have a generator that would at least have water and so hopefully air conditioning. With mortgage and insurance. So, in order to get access to traditional mortgages, Fannie, FHA, Freddie Mac, it requires some, the home to be um, titled as real property and taxed as real property. Otherwise, um, the, the, if they are taxed as personal property, then those traditional mortgages aren't, of the, aren't an option. Homeowner insurance and the National Flood Insurance Program require them also to be taxed as real property as opposed to personal property. Um, and in manufactured housing communities, one of the challenges that's happened in previous years is that personal these personal property loans that they must be financed with have higher rates and much fewer consumer uh, protections. So we need to make sure our buyers understand that what the difference is between having these homes titled as real estate finance versus uh, um, personal property, and that um, also that homes manufactured uh, to the HUD code, 76 and newer, have lower ownership costs than the pre-1976 units. Okay, and I think I finished on time somehow. So, um, if you could go one more slide, Deidre. So, I'm, I'm thrilled to have, that we have today um, Jason McJury, who is the Deputy Administrator for uh, Office of Manufactured Housing Programs. He's a licensed PE, a certified quality auditor. He's been involved in the relatively aspects of manufactured housing for more than 28 years. He leads a small but mighty staff, and they administer all specs, all aspects of the nationwide manufactured housing program, including implementation, the installation program, dispute resolution program, and the construction and safety program. So, Jason, welcome. Thank you, Stan. Thank you very much for having me. There you are. Yeah. So, Deidre and I have a few questions for you if, if you're up for it. Sure. All right. So, can you highlight some recent innovations in manufactured housing that have uh, significantly impacted the industry, especially in terms of like design, sustainability, technology? Sure. Sure. And to, to sort of start that conversation, you, 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 you touched on it a little bit um, when you talked about perception, right? Um, a lot of people have perceptions about manufactured homes in terms of what they look like. And, and far too often, it's an image of an older style mobile home, um, something that's a long, narrow structure with metal siding and metal roofs. But really, the, the design and quality of today's manufactured homes, like some of the pictures that were shown in the slides earlier, really rival the look, the feel. Uh, and offer the same amenities of other residential products. Um, and, and, you know, a manufactured home uses the same materials, components, and appliances uh, that any typical residential product does. But today, manufacturers are building homes with, with very steep roof pitches. Um, they, they offer open and spacious floor plans. Um, they have interior and exterior aesthetics 
uh, that really make a manufactured home pretty much indistinguishable from a, a site built home. Um, in, in recent years, manufacturers have uh, focused on quality controls, uh, making efficient use of materials. Um, they've focused on aesthetics, uh, expanding their consumer and market options, and they've also been focused, as was touched on, also uh, energy efficiency. Um, some, some more specific uh, market innovations that expanded the industry uh, include designs that integrate these um, more complex hinged roof systems to accommodate that steeper roof pitch. You know, you can't ship a, 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 a 17 foot manufactured home down the road today without hitting an overpass. So they have to, they have to hinge those roofs and sometimes depending upon that uh, roof pitch, those uh, 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 trusses can get pretty complex in terms of their design. Um, manufacturers are offering uh, home designs that integrate uh, attached garages. Um, some shipped with the home, some uh, with with some of those attached garages built on site. But the the the, the key is that those homes are designed um, for those attachments. Um, there's two story homes uh, uh, out there today, uh, and we also um, have some homes that are designed as attached zero lot line uh, or townhome style homes. So the innovations are certainly there. Um, Manufactured homes uh, are also some of the most energy efficient uh, homes available. Um, there's Energy Star certified homes, zero energy ready homes, uh, and solar ready homes. So uh, today's offerings uh, leverage the efficiencies of a lot of those efficient uh, appliances as well, from water heaters to uh, to, to to mini split systems uh, for for heating and cooling. That's awesome, Jason. That, I think that actually also um, answered the que some questions that we see coming in. So thank you for that information. We were wondering though, what steps is HUD taking to support the increase um, in needed af for affordable housing supply? And um, how does manufactured housing, how is that going to align with HUD's efforts? Sure. Um, just as, as, as Marian uh, Marianne said in her opening remarks, manufactured housing um, fully aligns with HUD's mission, right? Um, she stated earlier that uh, manufactured housing is one of the largest sources, if not the largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing. So manufactured housing is, is undoubtedly a critical component to addressing the, uh, the, the nation's affordable housing needs. Because of that, uh, it's very central to many initiatives going on uh, across HUD. Uh, manufactured housing has consistently comprised uh, about 10% of the nation's new housing stocks, stock each year. Um, and so the industry has proven uh, its ability to, to ramp up production when that demand is there. From a regulatory standpoint, which is the office um, that I work with, um, we're focused on updating the building codes and standards so that manufacturers can continue to innovate, continue to meet the future supply needs, uh, and respond to those changing consumer demands uh, without having a bunch of regulatory red tape to stand in their way. So we feel as though uh, accomplishing these regular code updates will allow manufacturers to offer homes that compete um, with the broader home construction industry. Um, and, and, and certainly keeping the, the code and the regulatory system up to date will continue to yield the high levels of quality, safety, durability uh, that both consumers are entitled to and the public expects from a, a federally regulated product. So speaking of those um, uh, of the regs, are there any up, what kind of updates to the code could we expect and what should grantees know about that? Sure, Stan, it's a, a great question. So um, some of the things that the innovations that I talked about earlier um, uh, have really come about through some code updates. Uh, in 2021, uh, we finalized a, uh, a building code update that included some safety aspects, but also some innovations, right? So uh, we, we've instituted requirements for carbon monoxide alarms, uh, increasing the safety of uh, manufactured homes with gas appliances. We've also added structural um, uh, and, and construction standards for two-story home application for the zero lot line uh, manufactured home design approach. Um, and, you know, we really feel as though these are all being leveraged to uh, add both diversity to the market and options for consumers. Last year, um, we, we published a proposed rule that would update reference standards. Um, I think it's uh, on the order of 80 plus reference standards and, and doing that will help manufacturers continue to use materials and appliances um, that are really state of the art and, and, and meet consumer demands. Um, in that proposed rule, we're also looking to add um, standards for multi-unit dwellings. Uh, and I don't want to confuse that with a commercial multifamily dwelling. What we're really talking about is uh, uh, homes that would be designed for an application like a duplex or a triplex. 
Uh, and we hope to get those uh, standards finalized and, and out there uh, in the marketplace soon. Um, we're also working on updating our minimum energy efficiency standards, uh, and, and we hope to get a proposed rule out in the public um, that would uh, address energy efficiency as well. Awesome, Jason. You know, with all of these updates, I'm sure um, some of our panel, some of our participants want to do something innovative like manufactured housing. So, where do would you suggest that they start? And are there any challenges that you think they need to be mindful of? Yeah, so uh, first off, I just want to say that our office certainly encourages and supports uh, innovation within the industry. Um, depending upon the specifics of an innovation, I mean, there could be regulatory challenges at, at the federal level, and there could possibly be site specific challenges at a state or local level. Uh, I think the best place when it starts is to really sort of determine whether or not those innovations would affect the, the design of the home or potentially the installation of the home. And when it comes to the, the design, it's uh, initiating conversations with the home manufacturers or potentially the home retailers that uh, partner with home manufacturers to uh, uh, to, to take orders. And um, manufacturers really know what they can build under our program. They know what they can't build, uh, and they know where there might be some flexibility where they can uh, get a special approval to do something that may not be in full conformance with our standards. But manufacturers and retailers have a close relationship, uh, and that would be the first place to go to for um, uh, an innovation regarding design. When it comes to, to, to the local level, there can be challenges with installations, uh, also known as setup. Uh, I think it was referred to as setup earlier. Um, there can be issues related to zoning and land use. Um, so understanding and addressing those key issues with local governments uh, and local jurisdictions would be key to successful development. So I don't know if this is a fair question, so feel free to say next question. But um, what do you see as the future of manufactured housing? Where do you see the, the industry moving and what do you see, I guess, its role in terms of meeting housing supply? Sure, no, that's a, a great. So, so we envision manufactured housing to, to be the preferred affordable housing solution, not an option of last resort. And we really wanna leave the trailer and mobile home stigmas behind us. Um, our statutory purposes are rooted in ensuring the delivery of quality, safe, durable, and affordable housing. Uh, and we really firmly believe from our office um, that the homes being built under the federal program oversight deliver on those statutory purposes and can really help start uh, uh, that home ownership dream or continue wealth building um, um, for the for the public. So how can people learn more, Jason, about this innovative manufactured housing projects? Sure. Great question, Dania. Um, so there are uh, many aspects to innovations, um, whether it's design and engineering to potentially uh, a regulatory um, uh, issue or challenge. I think, uh, as I said before, since a lot of innovations occur within the whole build, home building space, keeping an eye on manufacturer uh, information that's available in your region can certainly be helpful. Keeping an eye on retailer websites is, is helpful. Um, there's also two trade associations that represent uh, the manufacturing and other uh, industry segments. There's the uh, Manufactured Housing Institute, also known as MHI, and there's the Manufactured Housing Association for Regulatory Reform, MHARR. Um, you know, keeping uh, abreast of the information uh, that comes out of those organizations uh, can also help uh, uh, keep up to, up to date with innovations. Excuse me. Uh, and then lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our own information, right? So. Um, uh, we do uh, uh, publish uh, certain information and latest updates when it comes to the regulatory functions uh, related to the manufactured housing program. And, and folks can get that information by going directly to our website at www.hud.gov forward slash OMHP. Uh, and we list uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, helpful information for consumers, um, for manufacturers, uh, and uh, it includes all of the proposed actions I've talked about earlier with respect to standards and, and what's what's happening. Fantastic. This is that's some great information. Jason, we thank you for being with us today. Um, and once again, thank you again for Jason to Jason as the deputy administrator for HUD office of manufactured housing programs. We're going to move into our Q and a there's been some great questions that have come in and there's it looks like about 44 or more of those. I think that um, you will have noticed that some of the questions were answered while we were moving forward. I think some of the earlier questions um, and then there are go there are some questions that are going to need to be that will be addressed in the upcoming 
um, other sessions for the webinar. So, um, but we can get into a few of the questions that are here. And uh, so, Stan, let's tag team on that. Good? All right. Um, so let's do, let's see, is it safe to say that um, a manufactured home is a post 1976 mobile home built to HUD standards? Um, um, no. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just, I think we we're trying to cover that through our outdated perceptions and maybe weren't as, um, you know, blunt as we should be, but, you know, they're not mobile anymore. They just aren't. They, they people aren't moving them, I and also the, when people hear the term mobile home, they think of the metal on metal flat roof on pillars, not well constructed. Really, you know, it's a different product than than the old days. It's a different. It's it's, it's as Jason was saying. They're built to this. They use the same materials as they do on site built. They're built to uh, high standards. They're re energy efficient. They're resilient. It's a different product. It's just a completely different thing. So I would say, no, it's not safe to say that. Thank you. Agreed. Um, so there was a question about um, some uh, information wanting to to understand the pricing um, and wanted to let you know also that reminder that the, the, you will receive not only um, a copy of the transcript, um, but also the um, slides are going to be made available. And then there's source documentation that's on the slide. So that's gonna give you the information you were looking for that's coming out of the um, Census Bureau. Um, yeah, and I'll there, just say quickly the price the average time that's 72 points that's a national average and if you when you get the slide and you click on that link you can put in you can get state averages and you can get it for different years okay thank you so much so and we also covered um in the in the slides um earlier maybe you weren't um for those who may not have uh, logged on um, a little late. Um, there is a clear definition and a distinguishment um, as the difference between the different types of um, units. Um, and I'll just say units broadly because there are several things that we identified. So you'll want to make sure that you go back into and look at those slides so that you can um, have a clear understanding or how manufactured housing is being defined that's there. Um, so, one of the things is in reference to the data plate that's fixed that's there. Um, are there any safeguards that's the, um, what are the safeguards of it being re affixed in the event the cabinets are replaced during the lifespan of the home? Um, in my so experience, they don't get re affixed. <laughs> it's there at the initial construction and then sometimes it could be hard. Jason, you have uh, any insight on that? No, you're, you're right, Stan. I mean, um, uh, the, the real identification for the manufactured home can be the data plate, but that, that certification label, that red certification label um, is, is, is certainly critical. And there's also the serial number of the home that's stamped in the front most cross member of the manufactured home. It's stamped right into the steel member. If, uh, if, if that uh, information can be known, uh, we can look back in our uh, database of information to find all of the same information on the data plate. Thank you. Um, okay, so based on the, that cost uh, pricing question, uh, Stan, the, there is a question as to the square, square foot cost of manufactured housing, does it also include the pad? Um, the the question was also utilities. The answer is going to be no, no for utilities. No, we're just talking about the con the um, construction portion of developing that unit, um, not the land, not the pad, any, but with just the construction of that unit is what the per cost construction cost that we utilized on there. Um, we are at the one minute mark for four o'clock and we have, we understand and we see that there are more questions that are there um, and wanted to let you know once again that there are going to be, there are three other 
webinars in this series. And um, we really encourage you to be there because a lot of the questions that you have um, and that you posted really will be answered within the next two um, sessions, the uh, session number two and session number three will answer a lot of those burning questions that you have. So please, by all means, um, register if you have not already and um, go ahead and be in attendance and we'll be there as well. And we look forward to moving forward with, um, with everyone, wherever you are, we wish you well. We thank you so much for attending the introduction to manufacture housing and we'll see you on the next webinar. Have a good day. Thank you, everybody. Bye.